Hello, everybody. So we are going to be doing the uh, part two, three, and four, the free response questions today on the June 23 Regents exam. So you notice I already pre-wrote out the answer here for number 25, because I really wanted to talk about the answer for 25 uh, and come up with some of the things that you might have made mistakes on if you tried this on your own first. So it talks about a business office at a college wanting to determine the methods of payment students are buying books from at the store. Uh, and it wants us to explain how the office can gather an appropriate sample to minimize bias. So one of the things that we have to understand from this course is to minimize bias, you have to take a randomly selected sample. There's lots of ways that we can randomly select a sample here. We could ask um, every fifth person that walks into the cafeteria, how did they buy their books in the bookstore? Um, I chose to use the random number generator method which would be assign all of the customers at the store a random number and then use a random number generator to generate a sample of the customers. Um, notice I didn't get into specifics of how many customers are in my sample. You didn't really need to here. You could have. You could have said randomly select 30 numbers from the list of customers to get your sample. But the size of the sample is kind of irrelevant here. It was more asking about minimizing bias. Right. So if we ask every customer, which is what I'm going to assume some of you probably said here, that wouldn't be a sample. That would be a census or a population value. Right. So we don't want to do that. We want to take a sample. So we want a subgroup of all customers. So I'm hoping you got that one right. That was, I hope, an easy one. For number 26, we see a square root equation. So whenever we have square root equations, we have to isolate the square root, square both sides and then try and solve algebraically. Chances are if it's a square root equation, uh, it's going to come up either a linear function or a quadratic function that's factorable. So if I square a square root, I'm just left with whatever's underneath. And then the other side is going to be the expression x minus 1 squared. Remember, when you square a binomial, you have to multiply it to itself. So off to the side, I'll do some quick multiplication here. So we have x squared minus x minus x and positive 1. So we're left with 3x plus 7 is equal to x squared minus 2x plus 1. Well, since it's quadratic, I have to make this equal to 0, whether I'm factoring it or using the quadratic formula. So either way, I have to do this. So I have 0 equals x squared minus 5x minus 6. Now I'm going to try and factor it first because chances are that's what it's going to be. What well, multiplies to negative 6 but adds to negative 5. The two numbers that make that work are going to be negative 6 and positive 1. So this is factorable. So we get two factors, x minus 6, x plus 1. And from those two factors, I should get the two solutions by setting each factor equal to 0. So I get x equals 6, and I get x equals negative 1. But the tricky part about square root equations is you have to check them. So you could check these by plugging both back into the original and seeing which one gets rejected, if any get rejected. Or you can graph it and see what happens. So let's pull up Desmos here. So if we go y equals the square root of 3x plus 7, and then set the other side as the other equation, y equals x minus 1, you can see that they actually only intersect one time at the x value 6. They do not intersect when the x value is negative 1, so 6 is your only answer. We call this an extraneous solution. The next question asks us to determine uh, from this exponential function whether or not it's increasing or decreasing. Um, it doesn't say if I have to do this algebraically or not, so we could totally just graph this and explain what's happening in the graph and say that as the x values increase, the function values or the p of t values are increasing over time. I'm going to go about this using the algebraic method here because I think it's a little bit um, easier and it's, it's better to understand what you're actually doing. So in any exponential model, so we have any exponential models a times b to the x, well, if b is greater than 1, it's growth. If b is between 0 and 1, it's decay. So what we have to determine from this function is what's the b value when the exponent's just, in this case, t, just the variable t. 
So I'm going to ignore the initial value of 37. It really doesn't matter in this problem. And I'm just going to focus on this E number. So if I take E to the point 0, 0.0532, and I type that into my calculator, I'm going to get 1.05 dot, dot, dot. So because the base is greater than one, it's slightly greater than one, this is going to be a growth function. If I graph it, it's gonna be a really weird looking graph. It's gonna be kind of flat unless you like stretch your graph a little bit to make it look exponential. So you can say this is an increasing function growth because the base is greater than one. Moving on. So if we take a look at number 28, it gives us a polynomial, g of x, and it tells us a factor, and it wants us to determine the value of a. Now, this word tells us a lot of information. What that means is that when g of x is divided by x minus 3, the remainder is 0. That's an important piece of this puzzle. So we could do a couple things to answer this question. We could use the remainder theorem, or we could start dividing and kind of guess and check at what A is. I'm gonna use the remainder theorem. So because I know that this is a factor, I know that when I plug in the positive value of three for X, I should get a G of X value that's zero. So I know that G of three equals zero because of this piece of information. So I can say zero is equal to three cubed plus a times three squared minus five times three plus six. And then this just becomes an algebra question. Can I solve for a? So three to the third power is 27. Three squared is nine. I wouldn't write a times nine. That looks weird. So I'd write nine a minus 15 plus six. I then can combine up my like terms of 27, negative 15, and six, and I can get that 9a plus 18 equals zero. I can then subtract 18, and we can get the value of a now by just dividing by nine. And I can then say that a is negative two. So again, I used the remainder theorem to make this an easier question. If you wanted to go through and start doing the division, you could. So you could do a whole problem here where you're trying to create x cubed. You're trying to get ax squared. You're trying to get negative 5x. And you should get 6. And you could do like the whole puzzling thing and say like, I know this is x squared. I know this is negative 3x squared. I know that this is going to be negative 18. And you can kind of go through, uh, this is going to be positive 6, sorry which would make this negative two. And you can kind of work through the problem to try and figure out what has to be there to make this A value work. But why do all of that work, right? I wouldn't do it this way. I would use the remainder theorem. All right. The next one is a recursive formula for a sequence. So the first thing we have to do anytime we're given a sequence is determine, is it a geometric sequence? Is there a common multiplier? Or is it an arithmetic sequence? Is there a common difference? So looking at these numbers quickly, it does not look like there's going to be a common difference. They're really far apart. So I'm going to guess it's probably geometric. Well, to determine if it's geometric, I'm going to do some division. So let's do some dividing to see what we have here. So if I divide the second term, 63, by the first term, 189, I get 0.3 repeating. And then I'll pick a different um, set of terms that are next to each other. Seven, that would be the fourth term, divided by the third term, I get 0.3 each time. So basically, I could take any term of this sequence, like 21, and I can multiply it to one third, which is what 0.3 repeating is, and I can get the next term. So the basic rule of this function is every term is created by multiplying the previous term by one third. To write a recursive formula, you always need to state two parts. So you have to state the first term, 189. And then you have to state the rule. How are we getting from one term to the next? So I'm saying the next term, a sub n plus 1, is equal to 1 third times the previous term. 
remember your terms go up by adding or subtracting one each time. So like if you wrote all of your terms out, so if I had a term, the next term would be a sub n plus one, the term after that would be plus two, et cetera. So these two pieces together become your answer. Number 30 asks you to solve algebraically for X. I know you can solve this graphically. They don't want you to. They want you to solve this algebraically. I see that the variables in the exponent, so that tells me that I need to use logarithms to solve this. So the first thing we're going to do is go ahead and divide away the two because we want to isolate the exponential part. So I want to isolate this E to the 0.49 X number and I get 7.5 here. I'm going to leave 7.5 because it's a nice decimal. If it was a repeating decimal or like a really long, nasty decimal, I'd probably change it back to a fraction. Then since the base is E, we're going to take the natural log of both sides. Now, the reason why we're doing logs here is because one of the properties of logarithms says that if you have something to an exponent inside of a logarithm, that part can go out front. It's one of the properties of logs. So we can rewrite that as 0.49x times the natural log of e is equal to the natural log of 7.5. Well, the natural log of e is 1, so that's going to get crossed off. We don't need it. And to get x by itself, we would just divide both sides by 0.49. And then it just becomes, can you type that into your calculator and round appropriately? So if I type the natural log of 7.5 divided by 0.49 into my calculator. So remember the functions towards the bottom is where all the log stuff is. I know it's underneath calculus, but that's okay. So we'll say the natural log of 7.5 divided by 0 0.49. And we get this nice decimal. Now it says round to nearest thousandth, which would be three decimal places. So the answer here would be 4.112. Number 31 asks us to write this in simplest form. They want us to essentially factor and see what reduces. So we have to factor the numerator, we have to factor the denominator, and then look to see if anything reduces away. So to make my life easy here, I'm going to do them separate. So I'm just going to rewrite the numerator off to the side here. They give you this huge sheet of paper here, so you have plenty of space. I see four terms, so we're going to do grouping. The GCF of the first two terms is x squared, leaving you with 2x plus 1. The GCF of the second two terms is negative 2, leaving you with 2x plus 1. Well, since this is the common parenthesis, we can group it by saying, hey, the common parenthesis is 2x plus 1. And if I take that out, I would be left with x squared minus 2. That's going to be my numerator in factored form. No. I just did that wrong. This is negative 9. There we go. That makes more sense. Okay, so the GCF of those last two terms is actually negative 9. I made a boo-boo there. So if we take out negative 9, we'd be left with 2x plus 1. And now that we have that expression, we can keep factoring. So the first term is not factorable. The second term is factorable a difference of two squares, x plus 3, x minus 3. Let's talk about the denominator. So if I factor 3x minus x squared, two terms, it's not difference of two squares, but it is going to have a GCF, which will leave us with 3x, uh, at 3 minus x. So now let's put it back into a fraction. So the numerator is 2x plus 1, x plus 3, and x minus 3. The denominator is x times 3 minus x. Now, to look for reducing factors here, or reducing parentheses, they're either the same, meaning they reduce to 1, or they're opposite in subtraction, which means that they reduce to negative 1. So looking at these couple that we have here, this and this reduce to a negative 1. So my answer just becomes whatever is left. So I have all three of these things in the numerator multiplied together. I'm just going to put the 1 first. So negative 1 times x, 2x plus 1 
times x plus 3 divided by, there's nothing left in the denominator anymore except for x. That's your answer in simplest form. All right, let's take a look at the next question. The next question tells us that we have this app that's being designed. Uh, they, uh, they have purchased something for apps on smartphones for past three months, and the proportion uh, of people that have the app is 0.85. They did a simulation of 500 samples, so each one of these dots is a sample of 150 students. And the mean of all the simulations and the standard deviation of all the simulated data is given to you in the little um, distribution plot. You'll notice that this distribution plot does look normal, right? It's approximately normal, which means we can make an inference about it. We can create a confidence interval. We can do a lot of things with this simulation. So it says, suppose a sample of 150 students from your high school showed that 88% of students had purchased the apps on their phone. Based on the simulation, would the result in the high school be, uh, would the company have reason to believe that the assumption is incorrect? So we need to explain that answer. Now, this isn't actually asking you to make a confidence interval, but it makes sense to make a confidence interval to determine if 88% is in or not in the interval that we're confident the population value truly lies in. So I'm going to use the data from the distribution to create a confidence interval. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate our margin of error by multiplying 2 times the standard deviation, which would be 0 0.029. Well, if I do that, so let's quickly calculate that. So if we do 2 times 0 0.029, I get 0 0.058. To create our 95% confidence interval, we're going to take the mean of all the data, so 0.852. I don't know why I made a parenthesis there, 0.852, and I'm going to add and subtract our margin of error, making our confidence interval somewhere between 0.794 and 0.91. So what this interval tells us, right, is we are the 95% confident, the population proportion falls between 79.4% and 91%. Now, how does this help us actually answer the question? Well, if the proportion is 88%, that's within this confidence interval. So that would be a likely outcome. So what we can say here is no. Got to answer the question, right? Is the assumption incorrect? It is not because 88% falls within the 95% confidence interval. All Meaning it is a plausible outcome. Right? It wouldn't be an outcome that we'd be shocked about. If the number that they got from the sample of 150 students was outside the confidence interval, we wouldn't be confident that that could be the actual answer, so we'd agree that it would be an incorrect statement. Let's move on to part three. So remember, part three questions are worth four points, so they usually ask you to do more than one step. Right, So they're going to ask you to do something and then apply that to something else. So it tells us that Patricia creates a cubic polynomial. Cubic means it is a degree of three. And it tells us that the leading coefficient is one. That's nice of them. And it tells us that the zeros of the function are two, three, and negative six. And they want us to write an equation. It does not say that the equation has to be in any specific form. So you could write the equation in factored form. So since two is a zero, I know that x minus two is a factor. Since 3 is a 0, I know x minus 3 is a factor. And since negative 6 is a 0, I know x plus 6 is a factor. That is all you need to do for the first part. If you wanted to be a crazy person and multiply it all out to find the polynomial, that's fine. But it doesn't tell you you have to, so don't do more work than you have to. The next thing asks us to sketch this graph. 
So on a good sketch, you need to show me the x-intercepts and the y-intercepts, and you need to show me what the end behavior looks like. So the nice thing here is because it's a graph, you can graph what you just came up with. So if you go to Desmos, you can graph P of X is equal to, and just put it in factored form, X minus two times X minus three times X plus six. You could scale it so you could see what it looks like. You could see the end behavior. And if you click the graph, you should be able to see all of your key points. You could even show the minimums and maximums if you really wanted to do it. So everything that you need to know about the sketch of this function is right here for you. So when you make your sketch, you want to make sure you scale it appropriately. So the maximum value over here goes all the way up to like 90 almost. So we want to make this graph go up to like 100. The X values you could just make go out to like 10. And we want to put some specific points on this graph. So we want to put negative 6. We want to put positive 2 and positive 3. And we also want to put the y-intercept, which is positive 36, all of which I got from my calculator. Now, if we go through and make our sketch, we see that the graph comes up, it turns and comes back down, and then comes back up. And now we have a good sketch labeled, and we're good to go. Full credit, move on with your life, right? All right, let's go. Next one. The next one talks about a public radio station and a fundraiser. It gives us uh, some data in a two-way table. Uh, notice the two-way table does not have totals. So before I actually read anything else, I'm going to get some totals because I know I'm probably going to need them. So I'm going to total the supporter column to 1,600, the patron column to 2,688. I'm going to total the phone call row to 1,072. And I'm going to total the online call, uh, row to 3,216. To find the total overall, we'd have 4,288. Also, to make my life a little bit easier, um, I'm going to label some variables. So we'll say supporter is S, patron is P, um, phone calls we'll say is PC since we don't want to use P twice, and online we'll use as O. So let's see what they ask us to actually find. So it says, Sunir's thousandth find the probability that a selected donor was categorized as a supporter given the donation was made online. So we want to find the probability that the person is a supporter given they made an online donation. So this is a conditional probability. So for this, we only care about online methods of donation. So we want to figure out of the online donations, how many of them were supporters. So there were 1,200 supporters out of the 3,216 online donations. So notice we're only using that one row of this two-way table. Now it does tell us to show the probability to nearest thousandth, not as a percentage. So if I divide those two numbers, I get 0.373. And that's all you need to do for that first question. The next part asks, do these uh, data indicate that the supporter is independent of donating online? Justify your answer. So to determine independence, you need to see, is the probability of being a supporter affected by making an online donation? So we're going to test what's the probability of just being a supporter against the probability of being a supporter given an online donation. So the probability of being a supporter, that would be out of the whole table. So there are 1,600 supporters out of a total of 4,288 people. So that's out of the whole table. We already know this answer is 0.373 because we got it in part A. And all I'm doing here is testing, will these come out to be the same number or not? If I divide 1,600 by 4,288, I also get 0.373. These are the same. Since these two things are the same, that tells me that by given the condition of being an online supporter, it did not change the chance of being a supporter of this fundraiser. So this is an example of independent events. 
So we can just state the events are independent because the probability of being a supporter is the same as the probability of being a supporter given the online condition. If those two probabilities were different, then we would be able to say that they are dependent events. That's it. Number 35 asks us to algebraically solve this question. Now, before we actually do any of the algebra, we should figure out what the answers are. So if we go to Desmos, we can see how many times that circle and that line intersect and where they actually intersect. So we could just graph it x minus 2 squared plus y minus 3 squared. I know it's a circle because x and y are both squared equals 20. So we could see this circle. And we have y equals negative 2x plus 7. So we actually know the answers to this question before we actually do any of the math. So the first thing you should do on your paper is write the answers. So we'll write 0, 7 and 4, negative 1. The reason why you want to write the answers first is you get a point just for finding the answers if you did no math whatsoever, right? So you want to get that point right away and then try and do the math and see what we can do. So since this is a system, we are going to substitute. So I'm going to replace negative 2x plus 7 for the y in the other equation. They're equivalent, so we can do that. So I'm going to rewrite x minus 2 squared plus, instead of y, I'm going to put negative 2x plus 7 minus 3 squared equals 20. And then I have to use my algebra skills to try and solve this. So the first thing we're going to do here is multiply out x minus 2 times itself, which is going to give us x squared minus 2x and minus 2x and positive 4. So we get x squared minus 4x plus 4 plus. This we can clean up a little bit. That's going to become negative 2x plus 4 squared. So i got to multiply that to itself negative 2x and 4, negative 2x and 4. So we get positive 4x squared, negative 8x, negative 8x, and positive 16. So we're going to wind up getting 4x squared, negative 16x if we combine like terms, and plus 16 is all equal to 20. Since it's quadratic, I want to combine like terms and set this equal to 0. So x squared and 4x squared give us 5x squared, negative 20x, and positive 20 equals 20. If we subtract 20 to the other side to set it equal to 0, I get 5x squared minus 20x equals 0. To solve this, I'm going to factor. I'm going to take out a GCF of 5x, leaving me with x minus 4 equals 0, and that should give us our two x values. x equals 0 and x minus 4 equals 0, giving us x equals positive 4, which makes sense because the x value and y value we got from Desmos were 0 and 4. Now, to get this answer, you need to use one of the original equations. So I'm going to use the easier of the two, the linear, and I'm going to find the y value for each of those x values. So let's plug in 0, which is going to give me y equals 7. And I'm going to plug in 4, which is going to give us our negative 1. So again, we get the two answers, 0, 7, and 4, negative 1. Number 36. Number 36 asks us to write some equations here, so we have to do some reading. So we have this tropical island. There are 500 palm trees and 200 flamingos. Suppose that the palm tree population is decreasing at an annual rate of 3%. Uh, so annual rate is going to be Ra equals P times 1 plus R to the T equation. And our flamingo population is continuous. Continuous is going to be our PERT formula, PE to the RT. Now, make sure that you're using the correct variables here. It tells us to make the functions p of x for um, palm trees and f of x for flamingos. So p of x 
is going to start with 500 palm trees. That's our initial population. It's decreasing, so it's subtraction. So we would say 1 minus the rate of 0.03 to the t. You can clean that up a little bit if you want. You actually can leave it as is. But I'll make this 0.97 so we can see that it's decreasing. For the flamingo equation, well, flamingos start at 200. They're growing continuously, so that's going to be a positive R value, e to the 0 0.02 t. It then wants us to state the solution, round it to nearest year, and interpret the meaning of the value. Now, this does not say to solve this algebraically, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to see where does p of x equal f of x. So I'm going to graph this on Desmos and see where they intersect. So I'm just going to make two functions. So we'll make f of x for flamingos is 200 e to the power of 0.02x. And then we'll make our palm tree equation p of x equals 500 times 0.97 to the power of x. And I'm going to try and find my graphs because they have really big numbers. So we got to stretch here and see where they intersect. And we notice that they intersect at 18.159. So we can make a little sketch here. All right, so we have our one function coming down, our one function going up, and they intersect. So we could say x is equal to 18. It says nearest year, so we'll round to that. The second part here asks us to interpret the meaning. So that means that in 18 years, the number of palm trees and flamingos will be the same. If we're talking about equals, that's where the y value is the same number. All right, moving right along to part four. So part four gives us a uh, modeling question. It's talking about the average lung, um, average air in the lungs during a breathing. It gives us an original graph here. It looks to be sinusoidal. And it says using the graph, write an equation for N of T. So in this graph, I can see that the midline, the middle of the graph, is somewhere around 2,400. Right? Each vertical box represents 200. So we already know that the B value, oh, I'm sorry, in this case, the C value right, is 2,400. If I look at the midline of this graph, the amplitude is how far the graph goes up and down or oscillates from the midline. So that's going to go up 200, 400. So in this case, the A should be 400. And the whole cycle happens over the course of five seconds. That is going to be the frequency. And we remember that frequency, I'm sorry, the period, the period times the frequency, which in this case is B, is equal to 2 pi. So if we take the period of the function, 5, and multiply it by the frequency, which we don't know, we should be able to find the frequency value is 2 pi over 5. So now we know B. So we were able to find A, B, and C pretty quickly just by looking at the graph. So we can say N of T. Notice it's using T as your variable. Make sure you do that. The A value is 400. It tells us it's a sine function, even though we can see that from the graph. In the parentheses, we're going to put our frequency times T. Don't use X, use T plus our midline, which we said was 2,400. And then on the second page, it asks us more questions. So it says, the same long would engage in exercise as a volume that can be modeled by the function E of X. And notice it has a little bit of a different graph. And it asks us to um, sketch one cycle of E of X on the grid. So we see a midline of 2,000. Oh, I'm sorry amplitude of 2,000. I'm going way too fast. Amplitude of 2,000, we see a midline of 3,200. And the pi in this case is the frequency. 
So we're going to use that same equation from before, frequency times period equals 2 pi. And if I replace the V with pi, I can get the period. We need the period to be able to graph. The period is how long it takes on the graph to complete one cycle. So the period is 2. So when I graph this exercise function, I'm going to start at 2,000. It's still a sine curve, so it's going to start at the midline. Not at 2,000. I just did that wrong again. 3,200. But the amplitude is going to be 2,000. So I have to go up 2,000 from 3,200. So if I go up 2,000 from 3,200, I would be at 5,200. So I have to go up to 5,200. And I need to go down by 2,000. So I'd be at 1,200. Now, this cycle is going to happen within two seconds. So I know that in two seconds, it's going to be back at the midline. And then I want to count how many boxes it is in that full cycle. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I want to chop that up into four equal sections so I can make a good sketch here. So it's going to start here. After a quarter turn, it's going to be way up here. After a half turn, it's going to be back at the middle. After three quarters of the turn, be back at the bottom and back to where it started. So we can go up, back down, back down again, and then back up again. That's all you needed to do for the next part. The last part says, how many times during a five second interval will the two graphs intersect each other? Well, we have this graphed out to five. So if I just keep using my um, graph here, just keep graphing, I should be able to see how many times they intersect over the course of five seconds. So if we just keep going out two boxes and oscillating my graph up and down, we should see what happens here after five seconds. So we can clearly see from the graph, there's one, two, three, four intersections. So all they really cared about here for this last time, last example, the last problem is saying there are four intersections. That's it. Hopefully this video helped and you were able to do a lot of this by yourself at this point. Keep reviewing and you'll be fine for this Regents exam.